Okay, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to the first edition of our deeper dive into all things Revelation. Uh, we're doing this because, well partly, uh, there are so many things that I would love to share with you on a Sunday morning during the sermon, uh, but in interest of getting home, people home at a reasonable time, or not having people throw things at me, I decided to leave certain things out of my sermons. Uh, but uh, I thought, I, well, I maybe would create uh, some videos with some extra things that get cut out of the sermon. Uh, or just, I don't know, Revelation is just such a fascinating book, and such an interesting and a fun book, and also a very valuable and meaningful book that, hey, it doesn't hurt to have some extra stuff on this for whoever might be interested. So if you're watching this, kudos to you. I have no idea if anybody is interested in watching, uh, but uh, here we go anyway. For our first uh, talk, what I thought I would do is just share with you some of the various views on how you go about interpreting the book of Revelation. There's actually a very fascinating uh, history of interpretation of the book of Revelation. Uh, a lot of different views. It's one of the, it, it, of all the books in the Bible, this one has the broadest range of interpreters and interpretive uh, methods for the book. And um, so I thought we would, we would talk about that, partly some of it because some of you have been asking about that. Um, so we're going to talk about that. Uh, the other interest, the other interest of mine here is that you know I'm mindful that so many of you, we have never heard me preach Revelation before. So if you've heard Revelation taught or pre preached, it probably was from somebody else who very well may have been coming from one of these other interpretive methods, and so that might you might be trying to figure out okay, so why is this slightly different than maybe what I heard in the past or or whatever? Maybe this discussion will help uh, sort some of that out for you. So, um, yeah, let's get right into it. Basically, I got my trusty little chart here, but basically there are four main views on how you can interpret the book of Revelation, or in other words, to put it, what, how you go about interpreting all these symbols, right? Because that's the issue. Uh, Revelation is this incredibly symbolic book. It's an apocalyptic book, and symbols and apocalyptic literature, they just lead themselves to methods of interpret a variety of methods of interpretation and i do want to say real quick as we talk about this part of the reason we can talk about this is the book of revelation actually doesn't appear all too concerned that we nail down the exact specifics of all of these symbols right like if you think about the book of daniel where an angel might give a vision to daniel and then he quickly comes and gives an explanation of that vision that he wants daniel to have we don't get that in the book of Revelation. It's more like Revelation wants to paint a big picture for us, and it's not too concerned if we nail down all the specifics of the symbols. So we don't have to be obsessively concerned about that ourselves either, and we can look with graciousness at, at the variety of different views and perspectives and glean from them and learn from them and take what strengths they have and incorporate that. So anyway, let's talk about them. Four views. One view is a preterist view. What I have here is a timeline under each of these. This might be the easiest way to quickly classify these views. If this is a historical timeline between Jesus' death and resurrection and ascension and enthronement and his second coming as king, uh, the preterist view views the book of Revelation really in its entirety and all of its symbols and all of its imagery as referring limitedly to this period of time, a brief period of time, immediately following the death and resurrection and enthronement of Jesus Christ. More particularly, you'll find preterists um, think that the book of Revelation is primarily interested in this climactic conflict that happens between the Roman Empire and the church, or the Roman Empire and Israel leading up to the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. Or maybe some preterists would take it historically so far as to the fall of the whole Roman Empire in what was that, the 5th and 6th century. But the point is, the book in its entirety, with all of its symbols, refers to this brief window of time immediately following the death and resurrection of Christ and that conflict with the early church and Rome. Strength of this view takes very seriously the historical contextual nature of the book as it relates to the churches that it was written to. Uh, 
potential weaknesses of this view is that when it comes to these passages at the end of the book that seem to pretty clearly refer to the second coming of Jesus and noting that Jesus didn't come in AD 70 or with the fall of the Roman Empire, uh, they start to do some funky gymnastics to make the interpretations work there and it gets a little weird in my view in my, or in my estimation. On the other end of the spectrum you have a futurist view and if you take that same timeline, a futurist view views all of what's happening in Revelation, or at least from chapter 4 onward, as uh, representing events that will take place immediately surrounding, uh, immediately before the return of Jesus, right? At the end of history. So that's off in the future. It might not be too distant, because Jesus could come back at any point in time. But either way, it is symbolically referring to periods of time related to the return of Christ. Within the futurist view, you actually have a couple distinctions in that view. Um, the most dominant being a dispensational view. And I don't want to get too technical here, other than to name these things and say, hey, I'm happy to talk more about any one of these views anytime. But a dispensational futurist view sees a pretty hard distinction between the Old Testament people of God, Israel, and the New Testament people of God, the church, made up of people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And... A dispensational, at least a classic dispensational, would see God having two programs uh, or two plans for these two separate people of God, including two destinies and two final future uh, outcomes, right? And they would see some of the climactic events in the book of Revelation and particularly some of the things that to them seem like to be the, the, the Great Tribulation as part of God's plan to reclaim and restore and redeem the people of Israel, stuff the church really has no business in. And so in that kind of view is where you start to get all these conversations about, well, before a tribulation comes, which is meant for Israel, the church is going to get out of here, is going to get raptured, right? So in a dispensational futurist view, you have a lot of conversation and debate about the tribulation and when the rapture is, is it pre rap pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation, you know, and how does the millennium fit in with all of that? Uh, a classic futurist doesn't see that hard and fast distinction between Israel and the church, doesn't see these two different destinies, and doesn't get into all of those debates and discussions. Big picture, a futurist views the book of Revelation, its imagery referring to that period of time right before Christ's return. And I should say as well, too, a futurist is going to read the book of Revelation maybe a little bit more literally than I would, um, and more linear, linearly, meaning that starting in, verse, in chapter 4, the chapters happen sequentially, whereas I'm going to view them more as a um, cycle. And we'll get to that in the next video, actually. Uh, we'll break down some of that structure. But just tuck that away in the back of your mind. A futurist view reads chapters 4 to, through 20 sequentially, um, whereas the other views do not, and I, I do not either. Okay, a historicist view. I, this, these are, this is an odd bunch. Uh, the historicists, I maybe refer to them as the, uh, whatever, the New York Times view or whatever. They're, they're the ones who have... Uh, today's newspaper in the one hand and the book of Revelation in the other and are showing how the climactic conflicts of today are directly related to the uh, the issues that are going on or the pictures of Revelation. And the thing is, people have been doing this all throughout history, right? So anytime that uh, the Western church at least has faced traumatic conflicts, they've seen the book of Revelation all over that. Protestant Reformation had a big group of guys that thought for sure the Pope was the Antichrist. And this conflict that's, you know, played out in the book of Revelation is specifically referring to their conflict uh, that they're having the Protestant church with Rome, right? And so uh, they see Revelation as pointing to that event in history. Or maybe around the Holocaust, people thought Hitler was the Antichrist and all of this was written to, about that conflict, or maybe Napoleon was listed as, a, as one of the possible antichrists, and his conquest of Europe was... So anyway, I can remember as a kid, 
uh, going into a Christian bookstore and seeing on a shelf uh, a book that was all about how the first Gulf War with George H.W. Bush and Saddam Hussein was all, you know, signs of the end, and that Saddam Hussein was the Antichrist, and he was just like Nebuchadnezzar, and he had these visions for consolidating this empire in the Middle East, and, you know, whatever, these tanks were, the locusts were symbolic of the tanks that were, I, I don't know, this whole thing. So they were convinced, that book was convinced that Jesus was coming back any day because the events clearly referred to the trauma that was happening in the world at that period of time. Um... I didn't really talk strengths and weaknesses of the idealist view or the futurist view. We'll maybe come back to that. I struggle to know what the strengths and weaknesses are of the historicist view because that changes all the time. And the problem with the historicist view is that it's terribly comes from a terribly Western mindset. Like today, like throughout history, the church around the world and in non-Western parts of the world has suffered immensely. Like even today, like you think about the church in North Korea or Iran. But nobody seems to think that their conflict is what Revelation is talking about. It's only the conflict that we Western Christians uh, experience for some reason. And so it's just weird. So I don't deal with historicists a whole lot. An idealist uh, tends to uh, view the book of Revelation as referring to this whole period of time between the death and resurrection of Christ and the second coming. And... Uh, more just paints very symbolically this broad conflict between good and evil or between Christ and his enemies. And, uh, you know, maybe on the ultimate, on the way out end of the idealist and, you know, a, a real weak end of the idealist spectrum would be the guys who would say that Revelation doesn't refer to any kind of historical events in any way, shape, or form, including the second coming of Jesus. It's not about that. It's just the symbolic picture of good triumphing over evil, and beyond that, there's nothing much else, much more to it. Um, but on, on the positive end, the idealist, I think, takes most seriously the symbolic nature of apocalyptic literature. And so what you hear from me on a Sunday morning is probably very similar to an idealist, but I try to incorporate the strengths of at least the, the futurists and the preterists as well, too, because I do think that the book of Revelation does have some very specific points that's trying to express for the early church, right? And so I, I sympathize a lot with a, a, what, much of what I read in preterist literature, and I certainly think there's a futurist element to the book of Revelation, too, that it is leading up all the way to that time when Christ returns. So I do think there's a futuristic time, and so I think that is important. Um, but I don't think the whole book is all about stuff in the future. I do agree with the idealists that the book, the symbols of the book, have, are meant to show us the deeper dynamics of life in this period of time that began with the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and will continue all the way to his second coming. I'll flesh some of that out, especially the cyclical nature of the book um, in the next video. But let me give you one quick example of how these in four interpretations might work out. Let's take the number 666, all right? That symbol, the mark of the beast, the mark of the Antichrist. How would these four views interpret that? Well, if I'm a preterist, I'm noticing, and I forget exactly how this works, but how 666, according to the Greek alphabet line, somehow comes, up, comes out to the name Nero, uh, which would have been the emperor of Rome leading all the way up until AD 68, and he was the emperor that caused all sorts of havoc and hardship for the uh, early church. And so a preterist would view 666, Mark of the Beast, clearly, uh, that's the mark of Nero. Nero's the Antichrist, uh, and he's the one going around stamping, you know, all of his people and whatever. So, uh, if you are a futurist, uh, you don't give a designation to that number because the Antichrist hasn't come yet. At least we don't think. That's still off in the future. We don't know who that's going to be. We'll answer that question when we get there. Historicist, again, the Antichrist, well, some historicists have thought, well, it's, it's the Pope. Some historicists have thought it was Hitler, or um, Napoleon, or, uh, you know, some of the Muslim invaders of the Middle East at various points, you know, throughout history. And so they would say the mark associates with them, and they can find all sorts of creative ways of taking that 666 and showing how it means the Pope, or whatever. Uh, actually, if you Google 666 interpretations, you'll find all sorts of delightful creative uh, ways uh, 
that you can make the 666 match up to anybody. An idealist view uh, would say, well, actually, it's just a symbol. And don't read too much into the symbol, right? An idealist would say, hey, look at what's happening in the book as a whole, right? You've got this whole mock counterfeit trinity going on. The true living God exists in triune form, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But then you've got the enemy of God, Satan, who's parading around with his own mock counterfeit trinity, the dragon and the two, and the two beasts. And so, huh, we read in certain places that God seals in Revelation his own people. So guess what this mock trinity, or this, yeah, mock tr counterfeit trinity is going around doing? He's going to seal his people too. And if we could imagine a number that the true living God might take for himself, we probably would guess that would be the number seven, which shows up all throughout the book of Revelation. So, huh, guess which number the mock counterfeit trinity decides to take for himself? Six, in threefold fashion, six, six, six. So we're going to go around stamping our people, and we're going to give them the stamp of six, six, six. In other words, for an idealist, don't, don't read too much into it, other than just to say this mock counterfeit trinity is parading himself out as the true God and doing exactly what God does, and that's the bigger point of the issue. If you ask me personally, when we get there, we'll dive into it, but you'll probably hear from me some sympathies with the preterist view, because I do think there is a connection there for the early church, but uh, I'm also going to have some real sympathies with the idealist view as well, too. So, okay, there you go. Four views on the book of Revelation. Tried to give you some sense of them. I have to wrap this up because my camera's going to shut off at the 20-minute mark. It may already have been closed up. I may have made things more confusing for you. I don't know. But uh, I would be more than happy to talk about any of these further at any point in time and dive into more of the strengths and weaknesses or maybe where you come from in relation to this. Which uh, leads to this final thing I want to say is that I have certain topics I want to talk to you with you about in these videos. But if you have questions or topics that you want to dive deeper into or things that you're hearing in the sermon that don't, make quite, don't quite make sense or leave you with some questions, send them to me at asusick at gracebfc.org. And we'll dive into them here. Or, as I always say, buy me a cup of coffee. Or don't buy me a cup of coffee. Just come on over, and I'd love to sit and chat and talk it out with you. Okay? So there you go. There's session one. Four other views on the book of Revelation. Do with that as you wish. Thanks. See you next time.